Happy New Year. Is it still okay to say that on the 10th? I guess it is. January 10th, just not, uh, just not February 10th, right? So thank you for coming. Thanks, uh, John, for the, uh, for the intro. And thank you to everybody at Mentor Public Library. This is the first, uh, the first program of year 13 of this program series, if you can believe that. So we've been doing this monthly since 2012. And if I remember correctly, we even managed to, to keep it going most months during the, the height of the COVID pandemic uh, through the use of uh, Zoom. So uh, we are very happy to continue to, to do this. Uh, every month and so yeah as John said there's uh, notes on the uh, the table over there for what the rest of the programs will be this year I know that next month I'll be here again to, to talk about the life of Ulysses S Grant and then once we get to March I forget what it is because I know it's not me but it's somebody from our staff that will be here to give a great program in March on a topic that you can find over there on the paper and then all the way through uh, December of this year however I'm not sure if anybody is aware of this, but um, 2024 is an election year. So there's, you know, we don't ever hear anything about politics in the news, so I figured it was my responsibility to remind you of that. But it also seems like a good idea that th this is a great time to talk about a previous presidential election, the election from 160 years ago. And of course, this election is particularly notable because of course, one, it involves Abraham Lincoln, which of course is a great sell for any program or book or anything else. But also this is the election that took place in 1864 when the Civil War was still going on and that many people thought Lincoln might just say, we're not gonna do this because we're in the midst of a Civil War. Obviously he didn't do that. And so, uh, so this program is all about the re-election of Abraham Lincoln in 1864. So as always, being a, both a historian and a park ranger, I feel like I always need to give you some context leading up to the election itself. So we'll talk a lot about kind of what led to the election, what happened during this campaign, and then a little bit uh, about what happened after the election took place. Spoiler alert, Lincoln won. So if you didn't know that, I figured most of you probably knew that, but yes, in fact, Abraham Lincoln was a, a two-term president. And uh, the last thing I'll say before I get started is, it was a real struggle to determine which, um, which program to do in, in January because, of course, we have, uh, we have this great talk about, about Abraham Lincoln, but today is also a very significant anniversary for those of us down the street at the Garfield home, which is, it's the anniversary of the, the Battle of Middle Creek, which is a very small, relatively small battle in Eastern Kentucky, but it was the first time that Colonel James Garfield led troops into battle, 162 years ago today. So thought about talking about Middle Creek, but I, I decided ultimately to go with, with Lincoln, because again, I feel it's my civic duty to, to talk to you about politics, because you don't get enough of that. But as always, we are much more comfortable talking about politics from 160 years ago than today. So we'll stick with what happened in 1864. So what is the situation related to the Civil War leading into the year 1864? At this time, 160 years ago, what's going on as we start to look towards uh, an election in November of 1864? 1863 ends on a relative high note for the Union. Of course, they win significant battles, significant victories at places like Gettysburg. And then the very day after the, the, the Union victory at Gettysburg, we have the fall of Vicksburg out in Mississippi, the last Confederate bastion on the Mississippi River. So Gettysburg and Vicksburg coming on July 3rd and July 4th, 1864, very significant victories in both the Eastern and the Western theaters. We also uh, have the, uh, the Union victory a little bit later in 1863 at Lookout Mountain. Of course, it wasn't a perfect year. There were also some defeats for the Union in 1863. Chancellorsville, which is the battle that many consider to be Robert E. Lee's true masterpiece of tactics and strategy for the Confederacy. That was in May of 1863. That was a loss for the Union. Uh, that was also the battle at which Stonewall Jackson was wounded and then died uh, about a week later. And then another significant battle for us, Chickamauga, a very significant Union loss, very large battle, very bloody battle, and also the most famous battle at which James Garfield participated. But again, we're talking about uh, 1860, uh, the, the election of 1864 today, so we won't say much more about that. And then, of course, in 1863, in July of 1863, really just a week or so after the Battle of Gettysburg, we had the very ugly New York City draft riots. And in fact, a lot of Union troops that had just finished fighting at Gettysburg were then kind of redirected up to New York City to try to put down uh, the draft riots that were going on in New York City, which a lot of people 
protesting against conscrip conscription, of course, uh, not, not wanting to be drafted, but then they also kind of devolved into this sort of, a, for lack of a better term, like a race riot. Uh, so it was very ugly, very violent. So that was not a great, uh, a great uh, time for the Union uh, in the summer of 1863 either. Of course, we also, at the tail end of 1863, get uh, the Gettysburg Address from Lincoln. So, of course, the, the Union victory at Gettysburg takes place in July. There's this idea to start to, to create a national cemetery at the battlefield at Gettysburg. And the dedication for that takes place on November 19th, 1863. President Lincoln is invited to deliver, quote unquote, a few appropriate remarks. If you were here in November when I talked about the Gettysburg Address, you know that the, uh, the keynote speaker was Edward Everett, who spoke for two hours. Abraham Lincoln gets up uh, after Everett and speaks for two minutes, and those two minutes are the Gettysburg Address, what is now considered one of the most famous, most studied, and most important speeches in all of human history, not just American history, all of human history. This was the speech in which Lincoln redefined what the war was all about, clarified for the Union what they were really fighting for, this new birth of freedom, the idea that the nation was going to not put itself back together as it was, but it was gonna put itself back together, together better than it was prior to the war. So in 18, early 1864, a lot of people are in Lincoln's ear telling him that it would be wholly appropriate to postpone the presidential election. These are uncharted waters. This has never happened before. We've obviously never had a civil war. We've never had to conduct a presidential election in the midst of a war, much less a civil war, in which the country is fighting with itself. Lincoln refused and decided to, of course, adhere to the, uh, to the process late for, for elections laid out in the Constitution. And Lincoln, despite some of the positives that had happened for the, uh, for the Union uh, in 1863, really didn't think he stood a very good chance of being reelected. He felt like he was kind of fighting from behind and that he stood a very strong chance of being beaten at the ballot box in November of 1864, which I think makes it all the more impressive that he did still decide to go ahead with the election, despite the fact that he felt like he was, he was not in a good position and that he might very well lose. He still wanted to insisted that the country needed to proceed as normally as it could and so decided to go ahead and hold the election in, in November of 1864. And oh, by the way, there were a lot of people who thought that the Republicans could win in 1864. They just couldn't win with Lincoln. So there were, and I know this sounds crazy to talk about now, you know, Lincoln is like, you know, revered in American history, but there, uh, there were plenty of people at this time that thought Lincoln was, was not going to win in 1864, and they needed the Republicans, if they wanted to maintain the presidency, keep control of Congress, they needed somebody stronger than Lincoln at the top of the ticket. And so a lot of people were suggesting that Lincoln perhaps should step aside for the good of the party, for the good of the country, and someone else should be the Republican standard bearer in uh, in 1864. Remember, in 1860, in this period in American history, there's no primaries or anything like that, like, you know, the, the, the caucuses and the primaries that we're about to start, you know, uh, looking at here very soon uh, for, for this year's election. The conventions, the, the actual rep the Republican and Democratic National Conventions, those were the bodies that put together who the candidates were going to be. So the voters really didn't have an, any say until the general election took place, in this case in November. So there was no, you know, well, let's run somebody else and, and, and kick Lincoln off the ticket by another candidate beating him in the primaries. Those, that system didn't exist. So with, with Lincoln saying, no, he wasn't going to step aside, he was going to run for re-election, that really took care of it, unless Repu some Republicans could, could convince him to, to step aside and let somebody else run, which obviously they were not able to do. So what had the Republicans so worried as they were leading into starting to think about the, uh, the, the election of 1864. War fatigue, obviously, uh, is pretty understandable. The war, you know, which many people thought at the beginning would be very short, one or two battles, you know, we'll, we'll beat those Southerners on the battlefield and we'll remind them, you know, and we'll sort of slap them on the wrist and say, okay, you can come on back now. Uh, it was gonna be a short, a short contest. Obviously, that Th that theory had not panned out because here we are now going into the third or the four, really the fourth year of the war since it started in 1861. So war fatigue is a huge issue for the uh, for uh, for the Republicans in 1864. There are plenty of people in the North who don't 
care that much really about slavery, whether it stays or it goes, whether it expands or is held, you know, is, is contained only in the states where it already existed. So there were a lot of people that felt like the Emancipation Proclamation, which went into effect at the beginning of 1863, the previous year, was a mistake. So there were plenty of people that, that even though they wanted the Union to win the war and they wanted the country to stay together, they did not think that the war really should, should be dealing with or thinking about or talking about or having any, any effect on slavery. So there was lingering anger over the Emancipation Proclamation from the beginning of 1863. There was the, the chance that the Democrats might run a, what they called a peace candidate. In other words, a candidate saying, if I'm elected president, I will stop the war on day one candidate saying the war isn't worth it. We're going to get out of the war. As soon as I become president, the war is over. We'll negotiate a peace with the South. And that leads into that, that first one, war fatigue. A lot of people who maybe wouldn't have considered that otherwise by 1864 were thinking about that maybe it was time to just say negotiate a peace and let the Southerners go do their own thing. So there was that possible selection of a peace candidate on the Democratic side that was worrying to, to Republicans as well. Possible challenges from uh, other Republicans who were challenging Lincoln's authority and challenging Lincoln's place at the top of the ticket, which I've already uh, talked a little bit about, even though there were no primaries, there were still people that were other Republicans, and we'll talk about a couple of them here in a minute, that were interested in being president. And so there were a number of other folks who were, were willing to maybe step, uh, step, step out and, and try to push, push Lincoln aside. And then the other thing was so many Republicans or potential Republican voters were serving in the military. Would they be able to vote? How would they, you know, the, you, you know now we talk about absentee ballots and mail-in ballots and all this stuff that, that, that you hear on the news all the time. This was all kind of uncharted territory uh, in 1864. So how would all of these soldiers and sailors who were serving, actively serving, going to be able to vote? because there was a lot of feeling that they would vote to sort of stay the course and keep Lincoln in office and, and, and you know, see the war on through to the, to the end. But that doesn't do the Republicans any good if they can't figure out a way to let them vote. Uh, and so we'll see how they did that here as we go along as well. So as I said, there were a number of uh, other Republicans who would potentially consider taking over for the top of the ticket if Lincoln decided to step aside or if enough Republicans came to him and said, we need you to step aside for the good of the party, we can't win. So Ulysses S. Grant, of course, in March of 1864, so early in this election year, Lincoln decides that Grant is the man that he's been waiting for. Grant is the general he needs to see this war through to the end. So he brings Grant from the Western Theater. And you'll notice, I'm, I've mentioned this in other programs here, that uh, you know I used to be a pretty, a pretty strong Eastern Theater partisan. Uh, having grown up in Pennsylvania, but I really see that, that now that I think the Western Theater was, uh, I'll say, equal to or greater than the Eastern Theater in terms of its importance to the conflict, but it's certainly more important in the caliber of generals that it produced, at, at least on the Union side, and Ulysses S. Grant is, is, is foremost among those. So. We're used to hearing about, oh, you know, the first couple years of the war were such a disaster for the Union. That's true in the Eastern Theater, not as much in the Western Theater. There are generals who are fighting and winning for the Union in the Western Theater, but the Eastern Theater gets so much more attention and did even then, too, because there's Washington and there's Richmond right on the right on the east. And so those fights that were taking place in places like Tennessee and Mississippi and, and even parts of Georgia, which are thought of as the Western theater, didn't seem as important, but in reality, they really, they really were. So anyway, Grant is brought to the East by Lincoln in early 1864 and becomes the, the you know, sort of, uh, since we were talking about World War II with John before he stepped out, you know, Grant becomes, for, to use a World War II term, the supreme allied commander, if you will, of, uh, of Union forces. So Grant is the guy that, uh, that has won a lot of battles, and Grant seems to have the same philosophy about this fight as Lincoln, as Sherman, and even as James Garfield, which is you have to fight the Confederate armies where they are. If you capture Richmond, but you've still got 150,000 Confederate soldiers wandering around out there, what have you really won? And the answer is no, nothing, really. Maybe a moral victory uh, or a morale victory uh, because you've captured the, the enemy's capital. But ultimately, 
you have to fight and destroy their armies. That's how the, the war is going to be won. And Grant lives and breathes this philosophy, and that's what Lincoln has been saying from, from day one. So he brings Grant to the East in 1864, but there are a lot of people out there who are looking at the political situation and saying maybe Grant should run for president in 1864. Maybe Grant could, could somehow manage the, manage the, uh, the war from the, from the Army side and still be president at the same time. So a lot of people in both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, and I kind of made a joke earlier about the Supreme Allies, commander but in fact we have a we do have kind of a similar situation here to what happened with Eisenhower almost a century later Eisenhower you know is the supreme allied commander wins the war in Europe and both parties in the United States want him to run for president and nobody knows if he's a democrat or a republican but they don't care <laughs> they both just say we want you to run on our ticket and in eisenhower's case and probably grants too well maybe not maybe not grants because i don't think the democrats would have been too thrilled to see grant at the top of their ticket but certainly uh in eisenhower's case he could have probably could have won regardless of which party he ended up adhering to which of course he did eventually say he was a republican but in grant's case there are people from both parties that want him to run for president so lincoln when he brings grant to the east or really even before he pins that third star on Grant's shoulder, flat out asks Grant, do you intend to run for president in 1864? And of course, Grant says, absolutely not. I'm a soldier, I'm here to do my job. So Grant is not running for president in 1864. 1868, that's a whole different story, and that's a whole different program. So we won't talk anymore about 1868. I will talk about that next month, of course, when, when we do the, uh, the talk about kind of a, a, a quick biographical sketch of, of Grant next month. How about Salmon P. Chase? If you're from Ohio, like most of you probably are, you probably know Salmon P. Chase's name because he was a, a, an adopted Ohio when he was born in, I think, New Hampshire, somewhere in New England, but ev eventually moved to Cincinnati and had a very, very uh, illustrious career. You know, he was a very successful attorney. He served in the Senate. He'd been governor of Ohio. And he also desperately, desperately, desperately wanted to be president. Um, he had what James Garfield later called that presidential fever. And once it gets a hold of you, you can't let it go. Chase had sought the Republican nomination in 1860 when it eventually went to Lincoln. And if you've, you've heard of that book, Team of Rivals, with, that talks about you know, all of these political rivals that Lincoln brought into his cabinet, well, Chase was one of those. He made Chase Secretary of the Treasury. And Chase did a very, very uh, noble and, and good job of managing the nation's finances during the Civil War and coming up with all kinds of creative ways to finance the war. The Civil War was costing the, the, the federal government some, somewhere between one and two million dollars a day, which, you know, that's like chump change today, right? I mean, we hear, you know, it's, you know, that's, that's, uh, well, that's still more than, than James A. Garfield National Historic Site's entire f budget for the year, I can assure you of that. But anyway, you know, th th but this was a, a hugely significant sum of money uh, every, every single day. So Chase was a very effective Secretary of the Treasury. But by 1864, he still had that presidential fever, he, and it was in his head that you know, he was better than Lincoln, he was smarter than Lincoln, and really he, Chase, should be, should be president. And there was this kind of what they called a draft chase movement, just kind of a, kind of a you'd almost consider it like a write-in candidacy almost today, of people out there that were trying to get Chase to be the Republican nominee instead of Lincoln. Chase knew all about it, and he didn't do a thing in the world to say, oh, no, 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 don't do that. I'm loyal to, the, to, to, to President Lincoln, and I'm happy in my job as Secretary of the Treasury. He was more than happy to have people whispering his name out there. Uh, he pretended not to know anything about it because that was the noble and honorable thing to do. But, of course, he knew exactly what was going on, and he was even kind of pulling some of those strings behind the scenes. Lincoln was no dummy. And he knew exactly what Chase was up to as well, but he chose for the moment to look the other way simply because, one, he didn't think there was any chance that Chase would, would succeed him as the nominee, but two, Chase was doing a really good job as Secretary of the Treasury. And so this is one of those cases in his wisdom where Lincoln just said, I'm going to just pretend like I don't know this, uh, and we're going to let it go until we can't let it go anymore. And that, they do eventually get to that point. And so Chase is kind of, you know, banished to the Supreme Court, if you can call a lifetime appointment be, being banished. But uh, at any rate, for the moment at least, as the 1864 election approaches, Lincoln knows what Chase is up to, but Chase is doing a good job. And so he just chooses to ignore it uh, until he can't ignore it anymore.
How about John C. Fremont? John C. Fremont's interesting in that he was the first Republican candidate for president. John C. Fremont, the Republican Party was only created in 1854. So when Lincoln wins in 1860, the Republican Party is only six years old. That's amazing that they got you know, uh, enough of a, of a party apparatus built in just six years to elect a president. In 1856, two years after the founding of the party, John C. Fremont was the Republican presidential candidate, so he was the first Republican candidate for the presidency. He was fairly famous. He was, he was an army officer. He was an, a Western explorer. He was also married to the daughter of a very prominent former U.S. Senator, Thomas Hart Benton. So Fremont was very well known, and uh, he was very vocally, uh, he was a very vocal abolitionist. And during the Civil War, he did command troops. He was serving in the Union Army. And uh, at one point, as a Union general out in Missouri, one of those border states, and those border states, remember, are states that had slavery, but never seceded and never joined the Confederacy. And Abraham Lincoln was desperate to keep those border states in the Union because he didn't want all of the men and all of the material f materials from those states to be funneled to the Confederate war effort. So he was desperate to keep Missouri, Maryland, Delaware, and Kentucky in the Union. In fact, uh, I referenced James Garfield's battle at Middle Creek 162 years ago today. You, maybe you've heard, in, and that was all about keeping Eastern Kentucky you know, secure for the Union. Uh, you've maybe heard the famous, uh, the famous quote from Lincoln where he said, I hope to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. Well, it's the same thing with Missouri, which is also a border state and also the site of a lot of really violent irregular uh, guerrilla warfare, if you want to call it that, during the war. But at any rate, that's where, uh, that's where John C. Fremont is. And at one point in Missouri, he actually issues his own version of an Emancipation Proclamation long before Lincoln is ready for anything like this. Uh, and Lincoln ends up having to rescind it. <laughs> so anyway, Fremont has already kind of rubbed Lincoln the wrong way here. There was a, uh, a, what they called a radical democracy convention that took place, kind of a third party movement, I guess you would consider it as. Uh, in 1864 that took place in a little town called Cleveland, Ohio, which no one here's ever heard of, I'm sure. And that radical democracy convention actually nominated Fremont for, for the presidency. And Fremont very nobly said that um, he'll step aside and not seek the presidency as long as the Republicans nominate somebody other than Lincoln, which obviously didn't happen. So Lincoln, in fact, does get renominated by the Republican Party. Uh, they meet in Baltimore uh, in early June of 1864 to, to nominate their ticket. And they very wisely, I think, rename themselves temporarily the National Union Party. So when we talk about the 1864 election, we really could say it's between the Democrats and the Union Party, not so much the Democrats and the Republicans, even though, of course, the Republican, the Union Party was the Republican Party. It was just kind of a, you know, a, a, a temporary name they've given themselves to really emphasize what they're all about. And they did do something that was pretty revolutionary, which was they dropped the, vice, the sitting vice president off of the ticket, Hannibal Hamlin, who was from Maine, very vocal abolitionist, had been you know, loyal to Lincoln. And they, they really, in my view, dropped him really for kind of a, a flavor of the month candidate who just happened to be a Southerner, who just happened to be a Democrat. That now, you know, you've just renamed your party the National Union Party, and then you bring a Southern Democrat onto your ticket. Well, that shows union right there, doesn't it? So they drop Hannibal Hamlin and they nominate Andrew Johnson from Tennessee uh, as the vice presidential candidate instead. And of course, we all know that ends up being a very momentous decision. There are plenty of times in American history where people were nominated for the vice presidency to get them out of the way. You know, let's put them somewhere where they can't do any damage. And of course, that was, in this case, the, the vice presidential nominee was, was very important because we all know what happened, what ended up happening to Lincoln. So Johnson, in fact, Andrew Johnson from Tennessee does have the, uh, does have the distinction of, of being the vice presidential nominee in, uh, in 1864. The platform, you know, for the most part, when parties hold those conventions, they, of course, are nominating candidates, but they're also writing a platform, which is just a series of statements about the things that they believe in and what they stand for. And the platform in this case calls for the pursuit of the war until the Confederacy surrenders unconditionally and that there is a constitutional amendment banning slavery, which, of course, we all know as the 13th Amendment, uh, which did actually come to pass while the war was still going on. If you remember the movie Lincoln from 
I don't know what, 10 years ago or something. That's really what the movie's about. It's showing Lincoln uh, fighting to get the 13th Amendment voted on and then into the Constitution. So who's going to be the Democratic nominee is the, is the other question we've got to think about here in 1864. The, the front runners are George McClellan, who is a very interesting character to say the least, obviously a soldier. And then Thomas Seymour was the, the other potential candidate for the Democrats. But uh, the, the Democrats were kind of split at this point between war Democrats and peace Democrats. There were plenty of war Democrats who, of course, were you know, behind the war effort. A lot of them did not agree with the idea of emancipation, but they wanted the Union to win the war at least. And then there were those peace Democrats I talked about earlier who were the ones saying that the war should be stopped immediately. It was a waste of lives. It was a waste of money. It was a waste of everything. Uh, let's just negotiate a peace with the South and let the South go their own way. So that's a very big distinction between the war and the peace Democrats. Uh, so again, the war, the war Democrats supported the war, as the name would, uh, would suggest, whereas the peace Democrats wanted the, uh, the war to end as soon as possible. Those peace Democrats were often called copperheads, which is not a, uh, not a, not a compliment by any means. They, uh, they, they thought that the war was a failure, Lincoln was a failure, and that the, uh, the, the war should be, should be ended immediately. And Lincoln referred to the copperheads as the fire in the rear, meaning it's like friendly fire almost. You know, you're trying to fight this war, and then you've got people who are supposed to be on your side behind you, you know, saying, no, this is a mistake, and we're doing everything wrong. So he called them the fire in the rear. So the Democrats, again, were, were somewhat divided going into the, the election of 1864. They wanted a strong candidate to, to demonstrate unity. Remember, the Republicans have renamed themselves the Union Party. So the Democrats want a strong candidate to, to provide unity. And so they end up choosing George McClellan. And McClellan, of course, is interesting because he was, until very recently, a soldier in the Army fighting in the Civil War. He's not an old retired general or anything. He's a guy that was, you know, in the Army just, uh, just right up until, uh, you know, a year or so before the, the nomination process. Now, this is what's interesting, though. War, McClellan is a war Democrat, okay? He supports the war effort. He doesn't think that the war should have anything to do with slavery or emancipation, but he supports the war effort to win the war and to keep the Union together. So he is a war Democrat. So they nominate George McClellan as a war Democrat to run for president in 1864, but they pass a peace platform. So their candidate and their platform are going in two completely different directions. This is not a recipe for a successful presidential campaign, I can assure you. So McClellan is basically has to go out there and say that he disagrees with his own party's platform. So again, not, not, not a lot of uh, you know, foresight, I guess you would say, on the part of, of the Democratic Party here in 1864. Uh, but they nominate, uh, they nominate McClellan for president. They nominate George Pendleton, who's a peace Democrat, for vice president. So again, they've got, a, they've got uh, just like in 1880 when you had Garfield and Arthur from totally different factions of the Republican Party, you've got the same situation here with the Democrats in 1864 where you've got McClellan the war Democrat and Pendleton the peace Democrat on the same ticket and running on a, on a peace platform. So not a lot of logic to this. So obviously this hurts the Democrats. They, they, they've helped Lincoln immensely by again, you know, making sure that their candidate and their, and their, and their platform are, are saying two different, completely different things. Uh, McClellan tries to limit that damage as much as he can. In this era, uh, candidates did not give acceptance speeches. Today, you know, when we watch a convention, we see a, a candidate come out and give a speech accepting the nomination and talking about everything they want to do if they, if they win the election. This is not how it was done. In fact, at this point, candidates that were nominated didn't even attend the, the conventions. So after they were nominated, they would write what was a, called a letter of acceptance. So it's basically an acceptance speech, except they're writing it out in a letter, and it would be published in the newspapers and, and people could read it. So McClellan basically refers to the split in the party here in his acceptance letter and says he can't face his gallant comrades and tell them that we had abandoned that union for which we had so often periled our lives. So again, he's, he's running counter to what his, uh, his party's platform actually says.
A lot of Democrats very, very upset about the peace platform. They thought not only was it treasonous, but that it really, uh, really lessened their chances to win this election. There were plenty of soldiers fighting in the army, in the Union Army, who were Democrats. You know, not, not all the soldiers were Republicans. We talked earlier about how Republicans being worried about how they were going to get guys home to vote because they thought that, that the, the army, for the most part, would go Republican. But there were plenty of Democrats out there fighting. So imagine being one of those soldiers who's a Democrat out there, you know, fighting in the war and then finding out that the platform that your party is running on says that the war is a, is a waste and it's not worth fighting and it should be stopped. You know, it really calls into question, why are we here in the first place? And so, again, the Democrats really kind of shot themselves in the foot by, by the, creating this peace platform and running a war Democrat to, uh, to go on it. So, but the, the thing that they had going for them was McClellan, because, of course, McClellan was incredibly popular with the soldiers. Now, a lot of people would say, yeah, McClellan was popular with soldiers because he didn't actually want them to fight. So, you know, it's easy to be popular, a popular leader of, of, of troops if you don't ever ask them to go into harm's way. McClellan was renowned as an organizer. Uh, and so, you know, he gave, he gave the Union Army a real sense of esprit de corps. But the one thing that he really never wanted to do was, was commit his troops to battle if he didn't have to. So there is some nobility in that, of course, but it's also a, a bit of a problem for a general that, that doesn't want or, or doesn't see the need to, or does, can't make the decision to finally engage with the enemy, uh, with, with his army. So Democrats, a lot of Democrats thought maybe they could overcome this, you know, war Democrat, peace Democrat split by sheer, sheer virtue of McClellan being so popular with the rank and file soldiers of the Union Army. So, of course, we know there was, there was history here between Lincoln and McClellan. Of course, we see them sitting here together in this very famous photo after the Battle of Antietam. So there's Lincoln on the left, obviously, McClellan on the right. And Antietam was a strategic victory for the Union, right? It was a tactical, kind of a draw tactically, but it was a strategic victory for the Union because when that battle was over, this is in September of 1862, the, uh, the Confederate Army withdraws back into Virginia. So it's a strategic victory for, for the North, to be sure. So, you know, McClellan does have, uh, had, does have that feather in his cap. However, Antietam was also the victory that Lincoln used to springboard into publicly announcing the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and, uh, and, and McClellan, for, you know, as much as he wanted the war to, to be waged to preserve the Union, did not want the war to be waged to have anything to do with slavery. So Lincoln had hired and fired McClellan two different times to run the Army of the, uh, to run all Union forces and then the Army of the Potomac, and he had fired him twice. So again, McClellan was not one of those guys like Grant and Sherman and Garfield, like I was talking about earlier, who saw the value in defeating Confederate armies in the field. M McClellan was definitely a, hey, let's go capture Richmond guy. And then we'll sit back and say, isn't this great? We've captured Richmond, so the war must be over, right? And those 150,000 Confederates out in the field probably would have had something to say about that. So Lincoln had had, you know, had, had his, his history with McClellan, hired and fired him twice. McClellan was a lifelong Democrat. He opposed uh, emancipation. And he was very openly insubordinate to Lincoln while he was serving, still serving in the army. Uh, in fact, he called Lincoln a gorilla. He called him a bunch of other very unflattering names. And there's a great story about some point during the war in Washington when Lincoln decides he needs to talk to McClellan right away. And so he walks down the street to McClellan's headquarters uh, or to the house that McClellan's staying in and finds, and, and when he gets there, he's told McClellan's not here. He's at a, he's at a wedding right now. And Lincoln says, okay, I'll wait. And of course, the aides are sending people, you know, sending people, <laughs> sending runners out to find McClellan and say, the president is here waiting for you. Uh, and then when McClellan comes home and is told the president is waiting in the other room for you, he goes upstairs and goes to bed. So it doesn't even, doesn't even acknowledge that the president of the United States is sitting in his parlor waiting to talk to him. So again, McClellan, very, uh, very insubordinate, <laughs> you know, said a lot of nasty things about Lincoln. And now suddenly, here are these two guys running against each other. So again, just, just some of that history here, uh, a couple of the great things, a great, the great 
things that Lincoln said to McClellan. Uh, if you're not using the army, I'd like to borrow it for a little while. Because <laughs> again, McClellan had this reputation of, again, being a really good organizer and you know, getting, getting units organized and giving them individual insignias and really creating this sense of we are an army, but being very, very hesitant to commit that army to battle. He always thought he was outnumbered. He was always asking for reinforcements. He wasn't alone in that either. There were plenty of generals like that. But McClellan was, uh, was a professional. I mean, he'd gone to West Point. He'd been in the Mexican-American War. He'd even been sent overseas in the 1850s to observe the Crimean War to get a sense of how European armies fight. And then he comes back uh, to, the, uh, to the United States and, and still is, is very hesitant to commit his troops to battle. And then something that was kind of the bane of Lincoln's existence with, with McClellan and other generals, too, was they would never follow up a victory. So, you know, you win this great victory at Antietam, or when it comes to George Meade, you win this great victory at Gettysburg. You should be hot on their tails as soon as the other army starts withdrawing. You should be, you should be going after them. That's when they're vulnerable, when they're trying to retreat. So go after them and destroy them. And McClellan didn't do that after Antietam. Me didn't do that after Gettysburg. And so at one point, as Lincoln is firing off all these, these notes to McClellan after Antietam, why won't you go, go chase Robert E. Lee, go get him. At one point, McClellan writes back that you know, he, his, his horses are fatigued. He can't, he can't move very far because he has tired horses. And Lincoln writes back, tell me what your horses have done since the Battle of Antietam to fatigue anything. In other words, you're not moving, you've gotta go, move. Take advantage of this time. The army, the, the enemy is vulnerable. You know, Lincoln just, it drove him crazy about McClellan and other generals too. And that's again why he was so enamored with guys like Grant who just, they would just pound and pound and pound and pound and pound. And you know, when Grant came to the East in 1864, Grant said, we have a lot more men than they do. We can afford more losses than they can. And we will fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. And so if when one battle is over, we just, we move five miles down the road and we attack again and then attack again and attack again. And that's how you defeat the enemy. Uh, and that was not the, uh, the McClellan philosophy. So that's one of the reasons Lincoln is so enamored with somebody like Grant and not so much with McClellan. And again, the irony of these two guys now running against each other for president is, is, is rich. Now, again, the Republicans are not fully united. Uh, we know that there are plenty of Republicans, again, as I said earlier, who thought maybe Lincoln should, should step aside and somebody else should run. There were plenty of, of so-called radical Republicans who were frustrated with Lincoln. James Garfield was one of these guys who, you know, who were, were wondering why Lincoln wouldn't take much more decisive action to end slavery and to guarantee the, the, you know, the political equality and, and, and safety of formerly enslaved people. Radicals thought Lincoln was treating the South too moderately in his Reconstruction plan. Uh, you know, Lincoln had, had, had already started putting his plans out publicly for what the Union would do with Southern states after the war ended, assuming the Union won, of course. Uh, because he wasn't interested in negotiating a peace. His plan allowed for reorganization of state governments. Uh, this is in Louisiana, kind of a test case. The reorganization of state government, if just 10% of whites, uh, white men in Louisiana swore a loyalty oath and accepted emancipation. This was a non-starter for the radical Republicans. They wanted a harsh and a very punitive reconstruction for the South. They wanted the South to, to understand, you caused this war, this war was about slavery, and now you're gonna pay for it. Uh, so they thought Lincoln was being too, far too moderate with, uh, with the southern states. And, you know, radicals did have a point to, to, to some degree in that if these lenient plans went into effect, they feared that white, you know, former Confederates and white supremacists would, would take power again in the South. And that's pretty much what happened, unfortunately. Had Lincoln lived... You know, the whole history of Reconstruction and race relations in this country might be different, but because Lincoln died, the radicals were able to, to in, implement their plan, which created a lot of animosity in the South, and white supremacists did eventually take over the South again, and Reconstruction was, was for, in a lot of ways, defeated. But that's another program, too. So when Lincoln puts forward this model for, to try in Louisiana and, the, and the, the radicals don't like it, they counter with the Wade Davis bill, which establishes kind of a, a model for their brand of, 
Reconstruction, which would eventually go into effect after Lincoln's death. Under this plan, 50% of white men in a former Confederate state had to swear a loyalty oath, which included accepting emancipation. And in this case, they, the Republicans in Congress, would administer Reconstruction, not the president. Obviously, when under Lincoln's plan, the president would, would, would be the, uh, the most important person in Reconstruction. In this case, it was, the, uh, it was Congress. It was the radicals in Congress. And Lincoln, this, this, this bill passes both houses of Congress, comes to Lincoln, and he deals with it with a pocket veto, which means he just ignores it and he waits until the, the session is over. The congressional session is over, he takes no action. He doesn't, he doesn't sign it, he doesn't veto it, he just lets it sit on his desk. And this enrages the, uh, the radicals. They're really angry about that. So there is some division in the Republican Party as well. As I said uh, earlier, James Garfield was one of those who, uh, who for a time was very frustrated with Lincoln. You know, Garfield was uh, a, a born and bred in Northeast Ohio, a, a very good, strong, uh, reliable abolitionist area. And so, you know, he felt that the war was all about slavery. That was the root cause. And Lincoln needed to say that immediately. And I mean, he was, Garfield was saying this by literally two days after the attack on Fort Sumter when he wrote this very famous letter, or famous to us at least, uh, you know, the war will soon assume the shape of slavery and freedom. The world will so understand it, and I believe the outcome will redound to the good of humanity. So Link, or Garfield rather, April 14th, 1861, two days after Fort Sumter is already saying, it's all about slavery and that's how people are gonna see it eventually. And he was right about that. But he felt like Lincoln waited too long. Lincoln was dragging his feet on saying, we are not only fighting to preserve the Union, we are also fighting to end slavery. So Garfield was frustrated with Lincoln about that. Garfield was also very personally close with Salmon P. Chase. I talked about him earlier. He was the Secretary of the Treasury. In fact, Garfield even lived in Chase's house for a while and during the war uh, when Garfield was still in the Army and was visiting Washington. And, you know, he, yeah, he probably was... I'm sure Garfield was well aware of and maybe even just a tiniest bit involved in the, in the draft chase movement, but it really wasn't anything that he spent a lot of time on because he realized pretty quickly that Lincoln was going to be the nominee. And so he just kind of said grudgingly, we, we need to get behind our nominee. Uh, and so Garfield didn't really waste a lot of time on the draft chase movement because he just knew it wasn't going anywhere. If you think politics used to be this very nice, polite, gentlemanly, genteel, avocation, it didn't. It really never has been. You know, we see all this vitriol on the news today and, and we say, oh, you know, we're so fractured. This is the worst it's ever been. Um, it's not great out there, obviously. I mean, I think we all know that, but it has, it has been as bad or worse at other times. Go all the way back to the election of 1800 and read what, the, read what people were saying about Thomas Jefferson. Um, <laughs> Uh, a lot of which which later was proved to be true also, actually. But uh, anyway, they were saying some pretty horrible things. This is the same case with this, this election. You know, this was the era when political cartoons were really kind of coming into their own. And so these are obviously some anti-Lincoln cartoons here. And this one is really interesting. It's, Lincoln's hair is sticking up. It looks like he has devil horns. And, you know, he, uh, the, the barrel underneath reads gunpowder. And the, the card he's throwing down has a picture of a, of a black man's face. And so it's like he's throwing that card down and he's going to blow everything up. So, you know, an, very anti-emancipation uh, anti, uh, and, and very anti-Lincoln. And there were also, of course, some anti-McClellan cartoons as well. So here's, you know, McClellan trying to be the peacemaker between Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln. Here's McClellan looking like he's gained about 50 pounds sitting, uh, sitting, on, a, sitting on, a, on a ship and sipping a drink while, you know, while the, while, while the, the country burns. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just Democrats saying terrible things about Lincoln. Republicans were saying terrible things about McClellan, too. And here's just a great list from Harper's, which is a very famous magazine at the time all the different, some of, or, or they published this great list of all the horrible names that Lincoln had been called during this campaign. This is just a, this is just a, you know, a sampling. Filthy storyteller, despot, liar, thief, braggart, buffoon, that was one of, uh, one of McClellan's favorites. Usurper, fiend, butcher. The butcher, the butcher title was later applied to Grant as well in those battles of 1864 with Lee in Virginia when Grant was saying, we're just going to keep hammering them because we can take the losses and they can't. And people started, you know, and the union losses were just piling up and people were getting on Grant, calling Grant a butcher as well. But 
Uh, Grant didn't pay any attention to that because he knew what needed to be done to win the war and eventually was, was successful. So this is just a, a smattering of some of the terrible things said <laughs> about Lincoln. So this is a very famous, famous incident here, August 23rd, 1864. Lincoln, again, now just really, what, a couple of months out from the election, about two and a half months out from the election, looking at his chances and still feeling like he doesn't have a very good chance to be reelected. So he writes out this letter and he puts it in a sealed envelope and he has his cabinet members all sign the envelope. They don't even know what's inside, but he has them all sign it basically saying, that they'll, they agree to this, even though they don't really know what's inside. And so he says, uh, as for some days past, it seems exceedingly probable this administration will not be reelected. Then it will be my duty to, to so cooperate with the president-elect, McClellan, as to save the union between the election and the inauguration. Remember, inauguration at this point was March 4th, not January 20th like it is today. So you had four months between the, the election and the, uh, and the inauguration. It will be my duty to co so cooperate with the president-elect as to save the union between the, presidential, between the election and the inauguration as he will have secured his election on such grounds that he cannot possibly save it afterwards. So again, not a great assessment of the, the platform or the candidate of the Democratic Party there. But again, Lincoln feeling like he, he doesn't, he's not going to win. He thinks he's going to lose. So why does Lincoln win? What are some of the things that kind of put him over the top that allow him to win fairly substantially re-election in 1864? The informal campaign slogan, you don't change horses in midstream. You've probably heard that one before. This is where that, that originated, or, or at least was made, made popular. Maybe didn't originate, but was made popular. A lot of Northern Democrats, even though they were Democrats, viewed Lincoln uh, as the better hope to preserve the Union than McClellan. Because again, McClellan has never served in any office. He doesn't have any political experience, but he's also hamstrung with this peace platform. Uh, the, the Democratic Party is so fractured. So there are plenty of Northern Democrats who, uh, who actually did end up voting for Lincoln because they felt like you know, Lincoln was probably the better choice to, to, to keep the country together and to see the war through. And as I say there, the Democrats overbought on Northern anger about the Emancipation Proclamation. Thousands of moderate Democrats went into Lincoln's column when he put Andrew Johnson on the ticket. So at the time seemed like maybe that was a good strategic move. It was very expedient. You know, obviously it, it didn't turn out that way, but at the time it was, you can understand why they thought it might be a, it might've been a good move. McClellan basically ran against his own party's platform, as I've already talked about ad nauseum, so I won't say anything else about that. The Republican platform took a pretty firm stand on the war and the aftermath, uh, crush the Confederacy, punish re uh, rebel leaders, support a constitutional amendment banning slavery, offer aid, meaning uh, medical care, financial assistance to Union veterans, and demanding unconditional surrender. And there's that old joke that U.S. Grant, the U.S. doesn't stand for Ulysses Simpson. It stands for unconditional surrender. Uh, and that was, again, something that, that uh, Grant was a, was a major part of uh, in Lincoln's plans. And then, of course, there were many Union soldiers who saw the value in what they were doing and didn't want what they had done and the friends that they had lost to be taken for granted and seen to be a waste. And they thought that, that there was a better chance for that to happen with Lincoln at the helm than with than with um, a negotiated peace uh, or any kind of settlement with the Confederacy. Uh, there also were a couple of very important military victories very close to the election that helped Lincoln as well. In early September, just really, what, two weeks or so after Lincoln writes that letter saying he's probably not going to win re-election, General Sherman captures Atlanta major, major victory for the Confederacy. And then, of course, embarks from Atlanta down, the co down towards the coast and towards Savannah on the march to the sea. And then the Battle of Cedar Creek in Virginia, October 19th, 1864, what, two and a half, three weeks before the election. Union forces finally chase Confederates out of the Shenandoah, Shenandoah Valley once and for all. So again, two major, major Union victories right before the election that are important because they're top of mind for people, but it also leads people to think this is drawing to a close. We think we know what's gonna happen now. We think the union is probably going to win this thing. So why would we then bring in, you know, change administrations to one that, that you know, to a, a war Democrat, but who's got a bunch of 
other Democrats behind him saying, we're going to negotiate a peace. Why would we want to do that now when we're winning these major victories? And then, of course, the soldier vote. So they did, find, they did figure out ways to let soldiers vote. They actually had voting in the field. They, had, they, they basically had voting right out there in the, in the camps where vote, soldiers could line up and vote. And uh, Lincoln, di Lincoln won the popular vote. I used to remember the percentage, but it, it was fairly significant. Somewhere, he won the soldier vote b by somewhere between 15 and 20 percent or something like that. It's a pretty significant victory uh, among the soldiers that were actually serving in, in the field. So here's Election Day 1864. I know we're used to red states and blue states, but it's kind of reversed on this map. So the blue states are Republican Lincoln states. The red states are the Democratic states won by, uh, states won by McClellan. So as you can see, Lincoln wins pretty handily. It's not really that close. And the popular vote, it's uh, Lincoln wins 2.2 million to about 1.8 million, so fairly, fairly good margin there. And then in the Electoral College, I mean, it's a blowout in the Electoral College, 233 to 81. So needless to say, uh, Lincoln is, it wins re-election pretty handily. So this is just a, uh, an excerpt from Lincoln's second inaugural address delivered on March 4th, 1865, where he says, on the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, which is the Capitol building, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insur <laughs> insurance agents, insurgent agents, excuse me, insurgent agents who were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. And then going on, the, 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 the famous passage from this inaugural, uh, one of the famous passages, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. So again, that with malice toward none, with charity for all, that's a very famous line from, from this particular speech where he's basically saying, this is, we need to see the work through to the end, and this is, then this is what we need to, to focus on. We need to, to try to bring the country back together uh, as gently as possible. We need to take care of, of our veterans uh, and, and their children that they've left behind, and we need to reestablish ourselves as, as, a, as an, important, uh, an important country in the world and ensure peace with all nations. And then, of course, we know what happens. Uh, you know, just a month, uh, about what, five or six weeks after being inaugurated for the second time, Lincoln is assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, who is a Confederate sympathizer. He's from Maryland, very, very pro Confederate. And when the war, well, the war is not really over at this point. Lee has surrendered, but that's not really the end of the war. But it's clear at this point the Confederacy is done. And so, John Wilkes Booth decides that the best way to, uh, to avenge the South is to kill Lincoln. And ultimately, really, he, what he did was he, he, he killed the South's best friend because Lincoln was the one proposing the lenient and easy reconstruction path for Southerners, for, for Southern states. He was doing that because he knew that if the, if the South was treated gently and brought back in with uh, you know, as little discord as possible, that would make those white Southerners so much more uh, willing to accept, at least in theory, the idea of free black people walking among them, formerly enslaved people, the end of slavery. When the radical Republicans took over after Lincoln's death, they wanted that harsh, punitive, uh, reconstruction on the South. They wanted the South to suffer because the South had made the whole country suffer in their minds for the four years of this, this conflict. And so what that did, of course, was do exactly what Lincoln was afraid that would do, which is it made Southerners very angry, uh, 
uh, and it made them absolutely despise free black people in their midst and want to overturn emancipation in any way they could. And eventually white Southerners did, you know, white Southern Democrats did take over this, you know, state governments in the South and they reinstituted white supremacy to, to as much as the, the, the largest degree that they could. So, you know, had Lincoln lived, um, might have been a different story. Had Lincoln kept Hannibal Hamlin on his ticket in 1864 and Hamlin became president after Lincoln's death instead of Andrew Johnson, could also have been a different story. Hamlin was an abolitionist. Hamlin was from Maine. He was a, you know, he was, he was a northerner. So again, as, as with so many things in our history, you know, we can say what if and we could wonder, but that's really all we can do. So, um, so at this point, if anybody has questions, I know I went just well, a little bit long, but um, you're used to that for me by now. So any questions about anything we've talked about today? Sure. <laughs> at one point, you had a poster uh, with Lincoln with a crown on his head that said African. Oh, yeah. Can you explain that? So this is, this is kind of what it is, is basically a, uh, an anti-Lincoln uh, Democratic pamphlet. Abraham Africanus, his secret life, uh, something, something, mesmeric influence, mysteries of the White House. So, you know, basically saying, you know, not only is, is Abraham Africanus, you can obviously get the connotation there about what that means uh, with his relation to, to black people. Um, and then also this mesmeric influence and spirits and all these kind of just trying to scare people and make them think Lincoln is, is, is a crackpot or he's involved with these evil forces that, that, you know, are not, that are unbecoming of a president. Oh, yeah. Was the mesmeric thing a crack at his wife? Uh, well, is she the one? Yeah, she did seances and all this stuff. It could be, yeah, that could be too. If you ever come to our Edgar Allan Poe event, every now and down the street, every now and then he talks, he does a story where he talks about mesmerism and, and that goes back to the 1840s because that's when a lot of the stories were written in the 1830s and 40s. Um, so yeah, that, that could be, that could be kind of like they used to go after Nancy Reagan about the astrologers. They, they would go after Mary Todd Lincoln about the, uh, uh, the seances. Keep in mind too that um, uh, uh, the, a lot of times, you know, the, the seances or, or whatever term you prefer to use, was her way of dealing with grief over losing children. She was trying to, anything she could to communicate with her children who had died, including one, Willie, who died in the White House. They did lose a son in February of 1862 it, who died in the White House. Uh, and so I think a lot of that had to do with her, you know, she was a very, she, you know, three of her four sons died young. Her husband's murdered right in front of her. I mean, she dealt with uh, a lot and so, um, that, but that may very well be a, a crack at her as well, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Happy New Year, and see you, see you again next month.